chat, which we talked about in our SERP TD last week. And my other big projects uh, involve using AIS data uh, for navigation type stuff. And I work uh, with Ned Mitchell pretty closely and with Brandon and um, with Marin. Um, I don't know if you're in the, the navigation space. And so that's what we're talking about uh, some of that work today. Uh, this is work that was funded by uh, Jacksonville District through through um, a, a reimbursement that we did last year, and then Tanya picked it up so we could write a paper about this kind of stuff that it hopefully will be coming out like this week. Uh, I, I checked the final proof um, a couple of weeks ago, so I'm looking forward to having that. Um, we had a pretty big team for this. Uh, really thankful for all of their efforts. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is using AIS data to measure. Uh, how the ships that are in our navigation channels, how close they're coming to the bottom. So how much they demand uh, the deepest parts of the channels that we pay to dredge and how can we use that information to uh, consider how we, we rank ports so we can consider which ports have high demand, the, the vessels in the channels of those ports have high demand for the bottom parts of the channel, right? Uh, I did just mute myself, okay. I think I'm good here. Okay. Uh, I, I wasn't sure how I would be on this call. So uh, if you already know what AIS data is, please please forgive uh, the repetition. Uh, but AIS data is a, is a tracking system for vessels. And is a, it was originally developed as an aid to maritime safety and maritime domain awareness. Uh, so what vessels do that have AIS transponders is they're continuously broadcasting out their position, their course, their heading, their speed, and other information out uh, over the VHF maritime radio frequency band and any vessels or any anyone who has a receiver in the vicinity can pick up those transmissions. So the idea originally was that if it was like a super dark stormy night at sea, you can't tell uh, what the vessels around you are doing or if there's any vessels around you, uh, you can be receiving these transmissions, uh, put it up on some type of heads up display. Uh, and the reason they do that is obviously to, to avoid these collisions. They also have these receiving towers set up all across the country. Um, and they collect all of these transitions that are uh, all of these transmissions that are within the range of their coastal receiving towers. Uh, and they do that for forensic analysis in, in the event that uh, you know an accident does in fact occur. Um, we you can you can actually go directly to the Coast Guard and get this data. It's it's a little cumbersome to do. So we use uh, this nationwide aggregation uh, called Marine Cadaster which is published by BOEM and NOAA. They go into the, the Coast Guard database. They have some type of uh, un mem memorandum of understanding with the Coast Guard. Uh, they pull this data and they subsample it and they serve it out for the entire country. Uh, and that's the database that we actually use. There's a lot of other applications for uh, this data. In addition to this, I, I won't talk about, uh, this is one of them right here on the screen. This is uh, a project that was done by Brandon, who's on this call and then also uh, Catherine Chambers, looking at what vessels did in the uh, lead up to, during, and aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Um, but there's just a lot of other applications for this. Um, so why does the core care? Like, why should the core care about AIS data? Um, I, again, I, I didn't realize there'd be so many SAT people on the call. This was this was my FRF labeled talk to people who do a lot of beach work. But um, if you don't know what the core does, um, one of our big jobs is to maintain navigable waterways. We maintain 25,000 miles of navigable waterways, uh, and we spend a lot of money to dredge those channels. Uh, we spend about $1.5 billion per year to dredge, and if you're on the O&M, or the Civil Works side of the core house, this is the biggest expense that we have. It's the, it's the biggest Civil Works expense. Uh, we spend, even in Southland Division, they spend uh, about $350 million per year, I think, on, on uh, this type of, of work. So the reason why they spend all this money is because the U.S. Maritime Transportation System is a key, key, key pillar. Represents about $4.6 trillion in economic activity every single year, and that's an old number that was published by the Coast Guard. Uh, so it's, it's big, big money and big business, and it's very important that everything uh, continues to maintain and, and run smoothly. Uh, and most of the time it does, which is why it's kind of in the background of a lot of people's minds, um, except when it does not. And then all of a sudden the, the effects are felt very, very dramatically. Uh, some of these actually happened fairly recently. Uh, during COVID, there was a, a big backup of container ships trying to get into LALB. Uh, and you would have you would have noticed that like, if you were shopping at, at Target or something at the time, you would have felt the effects of this supply chain congestion. Um, 
vessels running aground. This is the Ever Given. They got uh, they got stuck in the Suez Canal. But uh, the point is that these these uh, channels are vulnerable to a lot of disruptions. And not only that, the demands on these channels are continuing to go up. Our ships are getting larger. These post Panamax ships are absolutely huge, and channels need to be wider and deeper to accommodate uh, those vessels. And the reason why we would care about AIS then is AIS can tell us what these vessels are doing, where they are in our channels, and we can combine it with other data sources to actually measure how much space they have uh, before they hit the ground, pretty much. So the issue the core has then uh, is essentially that we don't have the resources in terms of dollars or in, in this case, probably maybe plants, dredging plants, to uh, dredge all of our channels to authorize that all the time. Like there's there's shoals pop up and that's just that's just a fact of life. So we need to ensure good stewardship of our usage dredging dollars, uh, get the most bang for the buck. So support as much of this commerce as we possibly can. And the way the core traditionally allocates maintenance funding is based on uh, two things. So that the first is the criticality of that port to, to nationwide uh, commerce. And the metric that we use for that is tonnage. Uh, so, like a higher tonnage port is just uh, generally speaking assumed to be more important to the over. We survey our channels and we measure uh, when the channel shoals in. So, um, this is basically like if your if your channel is is maintained at a certain depth, like forty feet, uh, and it gets shallower than that. There's a shoal there in the channel, um, and it is assumed that that shoal can impact navigation. Uh, and this is true depending upon what the shoal was actually doing. So if the shoal was off to the side of the channel, maybe it's not directly impacting navigation. Um, also, if your vessels just happen to be drafting super shallowly, um, like in your channel, it may not necessarily impact the vessels that are are present. So this is not to knock this approach. This was the best approach that we had uh, when this this. Uh, racking and stacking of, of ports uh, was originally developed. And so, you know, we have better tools now. Um, particularly, we have AIS data, which we can use to measure uh, impacts of navigation and measure the demand for debt in our channels. So uh, this, this is part of a study that was partially funded by some of our SAJ folks who are here on the call. Um, we did two different things for them, and we'll just be talking about the first one here today, which is basically calculating the underkill clearance uh, for 13 ports within South Lake Division right here. And the goal of this is to be able to directly measure uh, the benefit of dredging to the vessels that are in our channels. We can also identify channel restriction locations. Uh, and then we can also identify areas where th there may be shoaling, but it's not impacting the vessels that have any present in those channels. So we're talking about this the second question here today, which is how much are vessels taking advantage of the dredging that we're doing? And we did that for these 13 ports in the upper right hand corner. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, and that's the day that we're talking about. Uh, we're also doing a follow-on study that starts basically now. It started a couple of weeks ago to update that for all of the ports in South Lake Division from 2019 to 2021 and 2022, as long as the interest in clearance data gets posted up. So, I mute myself every time I do that. Okay. Okay. So, what are we what are we talking about here today? We're talking about the vessel demand for depth, and the way we're going to measure that is by metrics that are related to how close do the vessels actually get to the bottom of the channel, and that refers to the underkill clearance that these vessels actually have. So this is this is what I mean. Uh, here we have our ship and our channel. We've got our channel depth, which is the uh, combination of the e hydro survey data, so it's our survey depths plus the available or excuse me the water depth from NOAA, and that's how you get your total channel depth at the time of the vessel transit. On the other side, we have the location of the vessel, which we get from AIS when it's there in our channel and the horizontal dimensions. So like the beam and length of that ship, uh, we get that from AIS. And then the final piece is what it was it drafting at that particular point in time. To, uh, for that, we have to go to the instances and clearances data, which is published by IWR. So between those two things, you can calculate exactly how much under clearance this vessel has uh, for any any point in the country where we have all of these things together, right? Uh, this is a lot of data. I'm um, up to about 30 terabytes on the HPC, and we're we're moving this into the NAV portal as we speak. Um, I'm really excited to you know have be using their Elasticsearch database, and it's gonna what it's going to allow us to uh, transition it from an ERDIC tool to a uh, more widely used tool. Is that 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 uh, platform is going to allow that? I'm I'm hopeful it will. 
Okay. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can describe when uh, vessels are, how close they're getting to, to the bottom. We just talked about the, the most obvious one, which is under keel clearance. Um, that one is really good for telling you what individual ships are actually doing. And we'll talk about some of the use cases for that a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, but we, we found it was very difficult for rolling up and racking and stacking across entire ports and across long time frames because it's, it's hard to pick uh, like which one do you want to report? Do you want the smallest under co-clearance that ever happened? You know, what if you just had one crazy ship driver who just went in there uh, and ran aground and everyone else is being, you know, smart and responsible? Um, do you use the average? Um, like, how do you account for uh, different channel frameworks, different things like that? So, uh, what we really want to be able to do is say, generally speaking, how close are ships getting to the deepest parts of the channel, to so the bottom of the channel, and how many ships actually do that? So the, the metric we devised to, to try to report that out and to get at both of those questions simultaneously is vessel encroachment volume. And this takes its inspiration from ship domain violations. I don't know if any of y'all are, are familiar with that, uh, but if you're not, uh, ship domain violations are, are this concept is basically invented by people who want to study unsafe encounters between vessels. So the issue that they were running into, uh, yeah, the issue that they were running into is that there's not there's not a lot of actual collisions between ships, and that's a good that's a great thing, and we don't want collisions between ships. Um, but if you're trying to do these statistical analysis, you, there's just not a lot of data for you to use. Uh, so what they do is they build these things called ship domains, which are uh, they're basically these artificial buffer distances around the ship, uh, and then they actually compare ship domain collisions. So these are these are not real collisions; they're more like close calls, and that gives you a little bit more more data to work with. We're very much in the same position when it comes to um, under clearance, right? So we need to avoid vessels hitting the ground and vessels don't run aground in our channels very often, right? It makes the news, you know, when they do. So what we're going to do then is we're going to artificially raise the bed up by some distance. Uh, we picked two feet and, and five feet, and then we're going to measure and report out uh, what is the volume of the vessel hull that uh, is below wherever that line is. So this is the volume of the vessel hole that encroaches on this domain. And so what I mean by that, uh, we picked two feet and five feet, and this is a schematic of what that looks like here. We have our little channel bed right here. Uh, you can see we've got a shoal forming here off to the right-hand side. Uh, for our first bed domain elevation at two feet, you just raise it up a little bit, and we just have a small amount of the vessel hole that en en encroaches or intrudes into this. Uh, then at five feet, we have a larger amount. We have this uh, this part right here. So we didn't just randomly make these these numbers up. Two feet is the paint recommendation for uh, safe, the minimum safe underfield clearance for vessels that draft 40 feet or less in full depth channels that are not impacted by waves. Uh, the five foot one is a little bit more hand wavy, uh, but Brandon and I refer to this part right here as like the Goldilocks zone. Uh, so you can think of this red zone. These vessels are getting safer than is, they're getting closer to the bed than is safe. That's a high risk transit. Uh, a vessel that gets only into the blue region here, they're using a lot of your depth, right? Because they're within five feet of the bed, but they're not necessarily at risk of, of a failed transit or running aground at that time. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip most of this slide, but the point of this is, is it's very easy to roll this up however you want, because you can just, you just add it up. So you pick your area that you wanna be thinking about, you pick your time frame. And you just add those things up and it makes it very easy to roll them up uh, into into a spreadsheet. For example, it, it does a lot of other things. It takes into account the effect of multiple transits. So it includes both the effects of how close are vessels getting to the bottom of your channels and how many vessels are experiencing that particular issue for this type of, of racking and stacking that we want to do across different ports. Um, questions here at this point. Okay, awesome. Um, this is my so what slide. Uh, I think when, when I gave this. Them available depth, and we do that through our dredging. We also know how much we supply because we, we quantify that supply through our surveys that we do. Finally, we know how much it costs us to, to create that level of supply 
for our, our customers, in this case, the ships in our channel, right? Uh, if you just go back to your, your basic um, your basic high school economics class, uh, it is not sufficient to know the supply of a service if you want to rationally allocate your resources, right? Uh, you need to know the user demand, and that is the purpose of this vessel encroachment volume. This is the user demand. How much are the ships in your channel wanting that bottom two or five feet of that channel that we pay so much to, to keep open for them, right? Uh, and because we have two different uh, bed domains, we can also segregate that demand by the risk of a failed transit, right? So five feet, you're using a lot of the channel, uh, but not so much that you necessarily at the bottom two feet, like you're, we're, we're cutting it really close here. Um, but my last little caveat here is we're obviously not making decisions. We are simply uh, providing more information, right? Because we don't want to run afoul of the Hatch Act. Um, okay. Uh, I said before this was this was this project was partially funded uh, through Jacksonville District, and then Tanya paid for us to write our paper. Um, these are the different ports that we actually uh, did for them, and this is what the data actually looks like. So uh, we're looking at here uh, is the vessel transits that occurred. My, my movie is frozen. Oh, there it goes. Okay, awesome. I thought my internet had frozen. Um, okay, we're looking at here all of the vessel transits. Can y'all see this, Tony? Is this thing playing? Hello? Hey, yeah, no, it's uh it's it's low. It starts Uh, this is a map of uh, the port of Mobile here off to the right. Uh, we've got our different channel frameworks outlined here in blue. They're labeled. We're also showing the different NOAA type stations that we use to get the water level. So what we're talking about here is this section of the channel up here to the north. Uh, this is it's part of the entrance channel right up here, um, uh, 1377. This thing is to scale. It's just a, a weird scale because I left it in, in lat long. So what's actually playing on the screen, our, our background colors, this is the available depth, which means it's the sum of the water level and I don't know what's going on with this. It's the sum of the water level and the e-hydro survey depth. Then these little rectangular prisms that are being plotted, these are the actual vessel position reports with our vessel hull outline. Uh, so like the, the horizontal footprint of this particular ship. And then they're actually colored by the undercoat clearance that that ship has at that particular point in time. So this is... Uh, the color scale for that is up here. So if it's white, that means it has more than five feet of active clearance. If it's a deep, deep red, that means it's scraping the bottom. So we're also keeping track of what uh, type of vessel this is and what it drafts. And then lastly, uh, what is the total encroachment volume on the five feet bed domain we've had up until this point in time? So we're literally just adding up, these are all the ships that have come through, and then how much did each one of these particular vessel position reports, um, how much did this particular vessel encroach on the bed at that point, just summed up. So the things to note that are super obvious about this uh, is, in the first place, most of, ves most of the vessels that we have don't actually get anywhere near the bed. Uh, most of them actually have plenty of space, and they just sail right on through with no issues. So most of your encroachment uh, is made by a smaller subset of users. So it's a small subset of users that are actually, you know, using the deepest parts of the channel. The second thing you may have noticed uh, is, I'm, I'm hoping it'll just stop at one, um, where, like, we have these really, really small, there we go, there's one right there. Um, these really, really small rectangles, these are ones where we don't know the horizontal dimensions of the ship. So we just have like a little small rectangle around where we know the AIS transceiver position was, and that's what we use when um, we're doing our calculations. So if you want to know what this looks like in, in cross sections, we just looked at, you know, from a top down view. Now we're looking in cross section. Um, this right here is one of our particular vessel transits. Uh, we've got our cross section line that is going uh, right here through the AIS transceiver position of this uh, vessel position report. Uh, and this is what it looks like. We've got uh, our water level line here in blue. We've got our mean low low water line there in black. There's not a big tide range in Mobile, which is also probably why you couldn't tell that the water level was changing uh, through time. This green thing, this is our uh, vessel hull. 
Now I said we, we represent our vessels as rectangular prisms that extend some depth uh, towards the bed. We could use the block coefficient of, of the vessel hull to try to discretize the hull over Uh, down here at the bottom, we have our channel bed. We've got our two feet bed domain. Then we've got the five feet bed domain is this dashed dot line right here. Uh, our vessel encroachment volumes, the shaded red region is the two feet vessel encroachment volume. The blue plus the red region is our five feet uh, vessel encroachment volume. So that's what the raw data looks like. Uh, I'm gonna skip these next two slides, but the point of this is you can do this for individual ports if you want to, um, but the spicy part is when we do it for multiple ports. So we're trying to we're trying to compare across ports. Uh, we're trying to trying to rack and stack uh, for how we're managing our, our dredging dollars, right? So um, this this slide right here is the first one I'm actually going to talk about of our results. What we're looking at here is a table where we have our port here on the left hand side. These are ranked in terms of their uh, their average tonnage over 2015 through 2018. Uh, Savannah and Brunswick are the, the dredging records in DIS were combined for these years, which is why they're aggregated here, uh, just for the sake of comparison. The, uh, the different columns in the table, uh, this first column here is the average two feet vessel encroachment volume. Uh, this is in million cubic yards per transit. So this is it's literally the two feet vessel encroachment volume of every single one of those stamped ships for every single channel framework in Mobile added up over all four years, so 2015 to 2018, divided by four. So just the average of that number. Uh, the second column is how many of those transits actually encroached on the bed at some point during their inbound, inbound and outbound uh, uh, transits. So uh, this is just the total number of transits that actually got within two feet of the bed over all four years, again, divided by four. These middle two columns here, this come from DIS. This is the average dredge volume for this, this particular port and the average annual cost uh, for this particular port. So. The point of this here is we can explore some alternative management metrics that consider this user demand for the bottom two feet of the channel, in this case, the two feet VEV and the average two feet encroaching transits. And we can weigh that against the amount of effort it took the core to provide this level of service. And by that, we can either use the amount that we removed from the channel or how much we spent to remove that from the channel. So there's two, there's two metrics that sort of uh, come to, to mind that you could do this. You can look at the ratio of the average dredge volume to the average two feet vessel encroachment volume. Uh, smaller numbers for this mean that relative to how much the vessels want this bottom two feet of, of your, your uh, the two feet that's closest to the bed, uh, you have a, a larger amount of vessels that want that bottom two feet uh, than we actually remove from the channel. Then the second way you can do this uh, is we can think about the core as spending money to purchase safe transits. And so uh, a way you can describe that is you can look at the ratio of how much uh, how much money we spent in these channels divided by how many transits actually got within two feet of the bed. Um, so smaller values in this case mean that we have greater user demand relative to either the volume or the cost that we spent to dredge. Um, some of these are, are fairly straightforward. Um, for, in a lot of cases, it 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 really is the most helpful for these these mid tier ports um, because your super high tonnage ports. You know they're they're going to get um, they're going to get some attention, um, but but the, the point is that this is how we can we can incorporate this this user demand when we're trying to make these type of decisions uh, because we're using both the dredge volume and the unit cost or excuse me the average cost to dredge these also incorporate the effects of the unit cost of dredging so if it's cheaper per cubic yard feed a dredge in one place versus uh, another. <clears throat> Let's see how I'm gonna do on time here. Yeah, okay, I'm good. I got plenty of time. Okay, so the two feet vessel encroachment volume, uh, this tells us which ports do we have ports, maybe they look fine now, you know, with the two feet, assuming you have a two feet margin of safety, but if you were to let it show in, they would all of a sudden manage to start to have a huge problem because we have a lot of ships that are sitting there in the Goldilocks zone uh, doing good. So we're doing a great job managing those, those ports. Um, 
but if we were to to let that slack off a little bit, all of a sudden we would have you know a huge issue. So this is where that five feet uh, vessel encroachment volume kind of comes back comes back to play. So here we're looking at what I call the difference of vessel encroachment volume. So it's five feet minus the two feet. So we're only looking at the volume of vessel that was in that blue Goldilocks region way back. Where's my figure that describes this? Way back here. So we're only looking at this blue part right now. That's the difference vessel encroachment volume. Um, okay. And what this lets you do is it's basically a, it's basically a thought experiment. Um, is if you were to just magically let your channel shoal in an extra three feet, all of a volume from the previous slide, and then the average annual cost to dredge, which we also saw on the previous slide. So. Higher values, generally speaking, so are redder are redder entries in this table. That means you would have more you would have more impact in both cases. So what we're looking for is a big discrepancy between the two feet and then the difference vessel encroachment volume, right? Um, those are the things that are going to indicate um, maybe you might have a lot in the Goldilocks zone relative to how many you had that are actually scraping the bottom in that case. Um, one of the things that jumps out from this table is that Port Everglades and Miami are, are just great ports, or at least they were for 2015 through 2018. And you're like, David, why would you say that? They're both they're both green, you know, uh, no, no big deal. Not a lot of vessels that are using the bottom of the channel because we didn't spend any, but the we wouldn't care about that for the core, right? Because just because our vessels are not being efficient using the bottom uh, two feet or five feet of the bed or whatever, doesn't matter to us if we're not spending any money. If we're not spending any money to maintain those depths, they can do whatever they want, right? Um, okay. Let's see. I'm trying to, there we go. There we go. Okay. So recall what I said uh, up at the up at the front that we weren't going to talk about undercoat clearance directly until much later. Um, there's still definitely a use case for how much space does indiv do individual vessels have in our navigation channels. But here we have to get a little bit uh, a little bit more galaxy brained, uh, if you will. So uh, I don't know who I was on the call, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just go ahead and explain what this is. Um, if, if anyone's not familiar with the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, actually is uh, it is. It is at least the, the the fee that feeds into it is either a tax or a user fee that is placed on exporters, importers, and domestic shippers to pay 0.125% of their commercial cargo value into the harbor maintenance trust fund. And that money is intended to go to maintain federal ports and connecting waterways. Um, it collected $1.8 billion in 2017, and the Corps of Engineers gets Now, the reason I said it matters a whole lot, whether or not you call it a user fee or you call it a tax, is because in 1998, there was a Supreme Court case, it was United States versus the United States Shoe uh, Corporation. And the United States Shoe Corporation alleged that the structure of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund fee, uh, alloc or fee collection violated the export clause of the Constitution, which states that no tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. And what that means is that uh, the Supreme Court found in favor of United States Shoe Corporation. And what that means is that exporters do not pay into the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Uh, and they haven't since 1998. And like, yeah, David, that's cool. Um, I, I don't really want to read these, this legal case nonsense. Like, what does that have to do with undercoat clearance? Um, in that Supreme Court case, uh, the Supreme Court cited a lower district court, uh, so a federal federal circuit court case called Pace v. Burgess. And in that case, uh, Pace v. Burgess, the was stamps. Uh, so the, the post office is allowed to charge exporters for stamps, uh, and they are allowed to charge that because that is compensation given for services that are in fact rendered. Um, so, like the, the post, they're saying that the post office can charge that because there's a very concrete link between how much they're charging and and the service that they are providing. Right. The problem with uh, for the Corps of Engineers, or at least the problem with the Harbor Managed Trust Fund, uh, is that the connection between the service that was uh, rendered and the compensation was too far apart. Uh, so your fee has to match the use of services. 
And, and what that means is that basically the, the cargo value, which remember the, the structure of the hard managed trust fund is based off of the value of the cargo, is a very poor proxy for how much of your the, the dredging service that the core does, how much the vessels are actually using that dredging service. Um, and we can, uh, th that's the reason for that is basically because the, the vessels that have extremely high cargo values are container ships. Uh, you can imagine if you have like a 20,000 uh, a ship that has 20,000 containers on it that are chock full of iPads, that thing's going to be worth a ton of money, right? Um, but because of the Jones Act, a lot of these container vessels don't actually uh, draft that deep because they're just simply not incentivized to, to draft as deeply as they possibly can. Um, the vessels that actually really, really want to drag the bottom, they want to get as close to the bottom as they can, uh, frequently are bulk carriers. Uh, so you can imagine, like, if your ship is chock full of rocks, you don't have a super high margin uh, for that 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 particular transit, like you have to get as many rocks on that thing as you possibly can if you want to make money. Um, but because rocks are obviously not worth as much as iPad on a on a on a, as iPads on a per you know per volume basis, they don't pay that much of the the uh, fee at all. So circling back to undercut clearance, the available depth in the channel is a USA service, and we're not. I don't think anybody's disputing that. Uh, undercut clearance actually measures how much each ship uses of that depth. Right, so how close does it get to the bottom is how much of the service that the core provides that they use. It directly measures that. So, and this is where we get to the galaxy brain part. Uh, if we were to change the structure of the hard maintenance trust fund fee assessment, uh, that would hopefully alleviate this issue that the Supreme Court found with the uh, violating the export clause of the Constitution. And prior to the Supreme Court case, exporters paid about 30% into the hard maintenance trust fund. So if we just uh, quickly imagine uh, that the total amount of funds is going to say that roughly the same. Uh, if we were to magically get back 30% extra money, we would go up from 1.8 to 2.6 billion dollars per year. Uh, and again, most of that money comes to the core. This also makes it fair. Um, because of the structure of the hard maintenance trust fund, a lot of ports that collect a ton, a ton of money for the hard maintenance trust fund don't actually get very much of that money returned back to them. Uh, the best example of this is Los Angeles Long Beach, uh, which is the highest Pay, they pay the most into the hard managed trust fund and they don't get anything. They don't get anything out. Um, the last thing it would do is it would appease some of our international trade partners who um, we have trade agreements with them and they, they, those trade agreements specify that we cannot levy tariffs on their goods, uh, but we still charge them this hard managed trust fund tax uh, when the Supreme Court has held, right, that it is, it is in fact a tax, right? So if it was no longer tax and that was a user fee, we could just sort of blow those uh, concerns off and be like, you know, this is just this is just the way it is. It's a user fee, you know, just suck it up. Um, so before I conclude and take my questions, I want to talk about new stuff for 24. Uh, we're doing our new reimbursable project for South Atlantic Division and uh, Jacksonville District. We're doing every single deep draft port in uh, South Atlantic Division. We're going to go all the way up to 2021 and 2022 if the interest and clearances data gets posted. We're also simultaneously porting this to a nav portal module. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about this. It's, it's so if, right now it helps me a ton to have it in nav portal, but I'm hopeful that once nav portal is live, there will be an actual tool that you can use to go in and draw a box and figure out exactly how close to every single vessel in your, your port, in your channel, in your entrance channel, whatever, how close do those vessels get to the bottom uh, for whatever time range you wanted. Um, we're also piloting some new metrics. Uh, we're doing some crossover with the CSAT team. Uh, I think one of the metrics that would be super useful is looking at how much volume would you have to remove from the channel to prevent the encroachment that was observed. Uh, this is a little bit different than the vessel encroachment volume because in the vessel encroachment volume, uh, you have the you have the potential for the same ship to run over the channel multiple to, to run over the shoal multiple times, right? Like on inbound and outbound transits. Uh, that's going to keep getting added up, which means that the shoal is, it's arguably a bigger issue if more vessels run over it, but it's not a direct correlation to how much you'd have to get, you have to remove in order for there to be no problem, if that makes sense. Um, we can also directly do that at that point, so we can look at the volume necessary to remove relative to the volume that's actually dredged to create this like dredging efficiency score. Um, and that's all I was going to talk about. Um, any questions?